Hello and welcome to Heart Talk India. Today in the wake of World AIDS Day on the 1st of December, we ask what is the situation really like in India? India is supposed to have the second largest population of HIV positive people, but in fact are the figures deceptive? Could they be larger? That in a sense is the core issue that I shall put today to my guest, the Executive Director of the NAS India Trust and one of India's foremost AIDS campaigners, Anjali Gopalan. Anjali, the Indian government claims that there are just 4.5 million people who are HIV positive. The United Nations says that the figure must be somewhere between 7 and 8 million, but some of the NGOs point towards figures of nearly 10 million. Mm. Why are we so unclear? Well, I think, number one, we have no mechanism to actually figure out the number of positive people. We just don't have that system in place. And therefore, I think what you have is estimates based on various models. And um, it's very difficult for you to come up with a, a correct figure in any matter. No matter how you try to do this, it's not going to happen. Let me ask you, does India actually have the technical capacity to come up with a correct figure? I don't think so, not at all. Just look, we have no mechanism. For example, if you look at the CDC in the U.S., all, every, each and every case that is diagnosed gets uh, reported to a central body. We just don't have that mechanism in place. Now, the Indian government figure, I'm told, is primarily based upon statistics obtained from antenatal mm -hmm. clinics. Is that right? And maybe STD clinics too, STI clinics, sexually transmitted infections. But from these two sources yes, only? Yes, absolutely. So does it mean that to begin with, it ignores that vast swathe of the population absolutely. that doesn't go to antenatal absolutely. clinics? Absolutely. Absolutely. And majority of the women who are pregnant do not access antenatal clinics. It's a very small minority basically middle-class women who are accessing those clinics, right? Uh, so therefore, you are not, if, if numbers are based on this, you're not going to get a correct number. And what about people who have, in fact, contracted the infection from the intravenous route or even from multiple sexual partners? Are they ignored by the figure as well? Well, I think the, the problem here is, is that we are looking at, at figures in a very narrow manner. Uh, we have people who are getting infected from the sexual route of transmission. We have people, and this is sexual route, whether it's men who have sex with men, men having sex with women, women having sex with men, all of that, plus IV drug users. However, because of the targeted interventions that the government of India has in place, we are only looking at certain groups and certain pockets. But you're saying that potentially all these different groups who could be HIV infected are ignored by the actual statistics the government is tapping. So you're not going to get those kind of figures because, for example, if you are going to ask someone in this country, are you homosexual, the chances of that person responding in the positive, even if they are, are pretty low. In which case, let me ask you bluntly, how much of a reflection of actual reality is the government statistic of 4.5 million HIV positive? I actually think it's the tip of the iceberg. I think if you're looking at, a, you could easily double or triple that number. Are you serious? I'm serious. You mean there could be as many as 12 to 14 million? I will not be surprised. But again, this is, this is just conjecture, right? I, there are no studies to indicate it, but it's just, it's, it's what we are seeing in our own work. For example, a small NGO can only access a certain number of people, right? But definitely in the last five years, we've seen a 100% jump in the number of people who are accessing our services. So to me, if that's an indication of anything, I think we're in great trouble. And is this supported by any of the test surveys that you've done yourself? We haven't done surveys at that number. Obviously, we are seeing, for example, in the last two years, we've seen over uh, uh, 2,000 people. So this is intelligent, logical conjecture. Absolutely. But Absolutely. it's the sort of conjecture that you're prepared to stake your reputation on. Absolutely. I, I really think this is, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. But the then let me put it about. like this, because depending upon which figure one goes by, whether one goes by yours or whether one goes by the government's mm. figures, we're talking about a size of population between half a percent and one full percent of the total of the Indian mm -hmm. population. Statistically speaking then, is HIV today of epidemic proportion? Oh, in I, absolutely. I think we've, we've definitely, we, uh, we have an epidemic on hand. Uh, the window of opportunity that we had even five years ago to be able to deal with this epidemic, we've lost it. I must point out to you that the government doesn't accept that you have an epidemic on hand. Well, I think there may be many reasons why the government doesn't want to accept it. Uh, for one, they don't want to be seen as a country which is affected by this epidemic because it has a lot of ramifications. Secondly, it is so linked to sexuality and sex that we do have an ac a problem accepting the fact that, that we are a sexual But you have no qualms using the word, we have an epidemic at hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is the correct oh, phraseology. Oh, 100%. I can stake my 
entire reputation on it. You're, in, you're not exaggerating, oh, no, in other no, words? No, no, I am not. In which case, at what rate is this increasing? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not the best, I, I'm not very good at numbers and I, I you know, it will at the best be an estimate. And frankly, at this point, whether it is 5 million or 10 million, we have a problem on our hands. Now, last year, the National AIDS Control Organization, which is in fact the government body that monitors AIDS and HIV infection in India, upped their figures by 15 mm. percent. Mm. Would 15 mm. percent therefore be the annual rate of increase? I don't know. It's possible that the numbers may be higher next year. We don't know. It depends in other words, it could be an escalating rate absolutely, of increase. Absolutely. It's and not an arithmetical, but a geometric it's progression. It's geometric. And also, I think the more sophisticated we get in, in, in our ways to get to, to figure out what the numbers are, we'll see higher numbers. In which case, Mr. Gopal, we have then, as you estimate yourself, perhaps as many as 12 to 14 million people in the country who are HIV positive. Is the medical system geared up to handle a problem of this order? Of course not. I think anyone who lives in this country and sees how things function know that we are not in any way close to being able to deal with this epidemic. We just don't have any of those systems in place. Now, of course, dealing with this suggests two things. First of all, it's a question of monitoring the people and checking on their rate of progress or deterioration. Mm -hmm. Is that monitoring happening? No, it's not. At no level? No, no, at no level at all. Even r right now what's happening in hospitals is we do not have uh, medications available, we do not have testing facilities available, we do not have trained doctors available, and even where doctors are trained, they are still denying services to people living with HIV. What about the simple question of medication? Are easily available and relatively cheap retroviral drugs on the market? No. Uh, right now, the cost of drugs are phenomenally high. Most people living with HIV cannot afford it. The numbers we're looking at is what, what even the government is saying is about right now there must be about 11 or 12,000 people on ARVs, which is nothing given the large number of people who are living with But the HIV. amazing thing is that Indian companies like Cipla and Ranbaxy have actually pioneered the mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. of genetic mm -hmm. ARVs. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers say that very shortly mm -hmm. these very companies are going to make them available at reduced prices mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. Is that going to happen here? Listen, it, it can happen and I think the government is trying to negotiate with them. However, if, you, if they're serious, they have to promise a certain number of drugs that they will order. And have they means, done that? No, of course not, because your system has to work. You, there have to be mechanisms in place to absorb those kind of drugs. Just so that the audience can understand, you're saying for these companies to be able to make drugs available cheaply and easily in India, the government has to guarantee a minimum take. Absolutely. That's not being guaranteed. Not at all. And also they have to cut back on excise duties. You know, this is where it will make a difference. So the government really needs to get serious about this. So when the government in the papers talks about negotiations with drug companies like Cipla and Ranbaxy to actually make antiretroviral easily and cheaply available, that's intention rather than reality. I think so. Because along with just the drugs, please remember, you need to have various testing facilities available. You have to look at nutrition. You have to look at distribution. You have to look at uh, not only access, but also treatment, how uh, trained doctors... And are these it. mechanisms not in place? No. And until not. they are, you won't believe the intention is for real? I don't think it can happen. So it's rhetoric and po politics, perhaps, but so. nothing more? I think so. And these things keep happening. Every time around World AIDS Day, you have a lot of this talk happening. You mentioned a moment ago that even when patients go to doctors, they don't necessarily get met with the right attitude. Are you talking about discrimination and prejudice? Oh God, yes. It is so deeply ingrained. Just last week, we had one of our own counsellors who was physically roughed up by a doctor because he wanted a patient admitted. Where was this? Uh, this was in a major government hospital in New Delhi, which is not allowed to turn people away. And we've had to finally file a report with the police, and we hope the police will follow it through. So your counselor took a patient to a Delhi hospital and was physically was roughed physically up by a doctor? physically roughed up. And this doctor actually said, he said, why are you wasting my time and your time on someone who is living like, who's gotten infected like this, who deserves to be infected, and we can do nothing about them. Why don't you put them on How ARD? typical of the medical profession is this particular I think anecdote? I, I think it's very typical. It's not unusual even today in a city like Delhi, which is the capital of this country, for us to, it is really difficult for us to get a woman who's HIV positive admitted for delivery. It, 
I am talking about this day and age, this moment in time. So, in addition to the problems that are connected with facilities not being available, mechanisms not existing, the cheap availability of antiretroviral drugs not being there, there is also horrible discrimination yeah. and prejudice. Absolutely. So, if, as could possibly happen, because no one can say for certain, a large number of the 14 million that you are saying today are HIV positive end up with the full blown AIDS disease, would the system in India be able to cope with them? No. The system, see, I think one thing we must understand, not everyone's going to start falling sick at the same time. And the moment we do introduce antiretrovirals, there are a lot of positives that do happen. For example, infection rates will come down. People will be living much healthier lives for a longer period of time. But still, with as many as you say, as 14 million people HIV positive, you could at some point in time have one to one and a half million people with the disease. Yes. The and, system and which is cannot why, cope with Which that. is why you need a revamping of the system, which is why you need the political will for this to happen. Because, um, listen, systems exist in this country. We have some of the best networks of primary health care centers in the world, right? You have every district having primary health care centers. There are primary health care centers around villages. Most of them don't work. And it's because of the absence of political because will. Because of the absence of political will. Okay, let's pursue this thing about political will because in a sense the most important issue is the actual prevention of the spread of the virus. Mm. With as many as, as you say, mm. 14 million people possibly HIV positive, mm. has the government taken serious and effective steps to prevent spread of infection? Oh Lord, I, you know, uh, 15 years into the epidemic, I actually think that we have done, our government has done everything to ensure that information doesn't get out to its people. Are you serious? I'm very serious. You walk down the streets of this city, do you see any information on HIV AIDS? Do you see any ads on television? Do you see, for God's sakes, we don't want to talk about condoms anymore. How are we going to not, how are we serious about dealing with a disease which is uh, sexually, predominantly sexually transmitted infection. You've been working in this field for two decades and more. What percentage of sexually active males in India today are actually aware of HIV and how it spreads? Uh, I think there are two things here. One is first accepting that we are an extremely sexually active culture. Secondly, I don't think people have all the information. In pockets you have people where studies have done, been done in certain states where you do say, where we do know that people do have information on what is HIV and what is AIDS. But then, God, interestingly, along with that, they don't know how it spreads and they don't know how to protect What themselves. percentage of the Indian male population is aware of HIV, roughly? I don't, we don't know. Would it be under 50? I really can't even take a guess on this one because we just don't know. There so are it's studies. very possible that the majority, perhaps even the preponderant majority, are not even today aware of AIDS? Most probably. Most probably. Now, the government has sought to prevent the spread of the infection by changing sexual lifestyles rather than by emphasizing safe sex. Is that wise and practical? Listen, I, can you think of anything that is more regressive? When has any government in the world been able to take a stand like this? It does not make sense. It is not the job of the government to interfere at this level. They cannot enter people's bedrooms. That's not their job. They need to get systems into place and they need to ensure that correct information gets out there to people so that they can protect themselves. This is not, the, they are not the keepers of the country's morals. What the government is doing is to advocate celibacy and monogamy as the way of keeping safe. Now statistically, something as large as 200 million is the size of the Indian male population okay. that is classified as migrant labor living away from their families. And then there's a further 44 million that are said to be street children living on the streets. Mm -hmm. How effective is a call to celibacy and monogamy in keeping them safe? <laughs> Obviously it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense, it's laughable. I mean, to me, it, where is the logic in any of this? You tell me, can, can, how can anybody control someone's sexuality? Is that something that can be controlled? Is that something that people are going to change or stop or not do because the government is telling the them? The government's response to that would be to say that the Indian attitudes to sexuality for cultural reasons, perhaps also for psychological reasons, are different to those of the West. And so Indian sexuality can be controlled. It can be contained within cultural limitations. Which world are they living in? What are they talking about? Which culture are they talking about? For God's sake, we've had a culture where 
sexuality has been celebrated traditionally. What are they talking about? I, it, it doesn't make sense to me at all. So in other words, what you're saying is that the Indian government in hoping to stop or limit the spread of HIV through changing people's sexual behavior is literally whistling in the wind. It's absolutely ridiculous. I, I mean, I, I can't even find words to describe this. Uh, why don't they do what they're supposed to be doing? which is preventing an infection in a manner where they can talk openly about an infection and deal with it. Otherwise, people are not going to be able to protect themselves. Let me put this to you. Does the government accept that, in fact, perhaps the greatest source of infection is what is called sex, casual sex, heterosexual casual well, sex, and multi-partner sex? Absolutely. But do they, they accept no, it? They have to, because NACO's own figures, if you look at it, they say 86% or 85% of the population has of infections that we know they have gotten infected through the root of sex. Now, whether they like it or not, they have to accept it. So when you say they have to accept it, are you saying that at the moment they don't accept it? I think they, they don't have any option but to acknowledge that people are getting infected through sex. However, they're really uncomfortable talking about it because of all these issues. Is this prudery? Oh, Is yes. it some form of cultural obstacle? Absolutely. Because somewhere we've got into our heads that our Indian values or morals we are, we are, sometimes I think they think we're from another planet because... But forgive me, I'm interrupting you. Are you saying that the government believes that Indian people sexually behave differently and therefore they will be yes, safe? they do. And I don't know where they've got this impression In which case, from. Let me again interrupt you because I'm doing a lot of interrupting and I don't mean to, but how does the government respond to the figures obtained by the United Nations Family Planning Association of a sexual survey in rural India which suggests that 42% of unmarried men and 22% of married men having are having extramarital sex. Yes. How do they respond they're to that? They're not. They're just not responding. Obviously, as you can see, but they're not they responding. But do they disbelieve it? I'm sure they do. But as long as they don't respond to it, they think it doesn't exist. They need to acknowledge. They need to acknowledge and go beyond that. And they need to allow... See, government must understand. There are certain areas in a human being's life, in a person's life, government cannot interfere. And sexuality is one of them. This is not their job. They do not have the resources or the capability to interact with people at that level. But it's not every politician who, in a sense, no. is blind. For instance, Oscar Fernandez, mm -hmm. the convener of the Parliamentary Forum mm -hmm. on HIV AIDS, says, and he said it apparently as recently as October mm -hmm. in a speech to mm -hmm. the Confederation of mm -hmm. Indian Industry, mm -hmm. that 60 percent mm -hmm. of college mm -hmm. students have mm -hmm. had their first sexual experience mm -hmm. before graduation. Absolutely. So there are politicians who see the light mm -hmm. and see the need, presumably, mm -hmm. to act. Absolutely. Why is the government impervious to them? I don't know. And I think part of it is, for example, even if you look at that parliamentary forum, you have groups of people who are saying, look, we need to do something. About it. You, have, you have elected representatives saying we need to do something about it. Yet the response of the government, the government that is in power, is absolutely uh, uh, is non-existent. Let me ask you a blunt question. When you say the response of the government, are you in fact saying the response of the Minister of Health, Shushma Swaraj? Well, to a large extent, yes, because what she says means a lot. That's what carries weight. Is this belief that the Indian population can be kept safe because A, as Indians, their sexual behavior is different, and B, because we can actually change it and limit it, mm. is that a belief that is uniquely Shushma Swaraj? I don't know, but definitely it's coming from here. From her? From, well, she's said it publicly that she is the keeper of this country's morals. I remember in an, uh, in an interview she said that. Is she the reason why campaigning to do with and advertising to do with the Condom. use of condoms has been removed from Indian Absolutely. television? Absolutely. Earlier when she was in the Ministry of Information and now in the Ministry of Health, ever since she's been in both these places, anything to do with condoms have been removed. So and she actually talks about ABC, abstinence and be faithful and then says, okay, maybe we should talk about So condoms. would you go so far as to say that because of her own rigid beliefs about the nature of the Indian people, she is actually putting at risk millions because they actually behave normally unlike what she thinks they should do. I think so, yes, absolutely. She is endangering people's she lives. She is endangering the life of our people. She needs to understand that it's really important that, that she sees the reality for what it is. And there's nothing wrong in people being sexually active. You mean this, you're not just being an active campaigner using no, exaggerated no, language. No, I'm just tired of this, you know. I just think we are allowing for infections to happen. We are ensuring that this infection continues to spread. And tomorrow, people have the right to turn around and ask people like us who are in the field and ask, 
her, she is an elected representative of the people. What she has done to prevent this? What does she say when you put these points to her, as you must have? Well, I, I don't think we've, we've got much of a response from her, apart from... I mean, does she not listen or does she shut the door? What I does she do? I am not... Uh, see, I am not very sure that um, uh, she's taken a, taken a stand openly uh, in any way different from what she has publicly taken earlier. And I think that continues, because somewhere deep down she does believe in what she's saying. So she is so convinced about her belief yes. in the Indian sexual behavior being different to that of the West, that she sees no need to listen to people with contrary opinions. That's my understanding. Now, up till now, it's always said that those who contracted HIV infection in India through sexual transmission have got it through the heterosexual route. But the very same United Nations Family Planning Association survey of sexual behavior in rural India that I quoted earlier, and I should add mm. that so far, in fact, it is an unpublished mm. survey, mm. says that more men, unmarried men in rural India, mm. are likely to have sex with other men mm. than with commercial sex mm. workers. Yes. First of all, how credible are those findings? Oh, I think extremely credible, because we do a lot of work in men who have sex with men. It's one of our largest programs. And uh, definitely we are finding that Men having sex with men is extremely high, even in a city like Delhi. A lot of these people are coming from rural areas. So, and it's something that they have been sexually active even before coming to the urban area. So areas. even though Indian society ignores men having sex with men and sometimes even denies, denies that this it. is the case, you're saying that it is much greater Absolutely. and much more widespread than people Absolutely. understand. Absolutely. And, and look, there are reasons for it. For example, look around us. We are an extremely... Uh, uh, you see men together all the time. All public spaces are dominated by males. Men obviously are very comfortable with other men. So I think sex very often is just an extension of that. And when you talk to men, it's interesting because they will say things like, we will not use condoms uh, when we're having sex with other men because they don't they see that. They say that? Oh, yeah. They don't see that as So the risky. people that you've been talking to and dealing with who don't actually consider themselves to be gay in the Western sense right, of the term, right. still acknowledge quite openly yeah. that they have sex with men. They have sex with men. In which case, pause and tell me, if this is the reality and if it is as widespread as you suggest it is, what are the implications for the spread of HIV AIDS in India? Oh, I, I, that's why I'm saying I actually see this infection going from men to men to women. I actually see that every day of my life. So I just cannot understand why we are getting caught in this rhetoric of heterosexual, homosexual, because those kind of definitions don't exist in our culture. There are very few men... There is a lot more men. bisexual sex I happening so. than oh. the Indian society officially acknowledges. Yes. But you're also saying that the Indian society, which may not officially acknowledge it, is actually aware of it and yeah. accepts it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, by the way, this is something great about our culture, I think. Long as you are not in anyone's face about anything, they will accept it. It will become an issue and it will become a problem when it becomes an issue of rights. In which case, how important alongside all the other measures we've discussed earlier would be the decriminalization of homosexuality? I think that is really key to prevention in this country today. Because I think what's happening is with Section 377, which is an archaic anti-sodomy That's the law. section yeah. that actually which, decriminalizes which homosexuality. Criminalizes you see, what it does is, it's not just homosexuality, interestingly. What it says is, if you have sex against the order of nature with man, woman, or beast, you can be punished. And the existence of this section drives under the carpet into the illegal area Absolutely. and the black area of life, areas that should, in fact, be open. Absolutely. And therefore, the spread or the danger of spread grows. Absolutely. And also, it does impact interventions. For example, if you do want to give condoms in prisons, one of the reasons that they do quote, prison officials do quote very often, apart from the fact that we don't have sex in prisons in our country, they will also say that, oh, Section 7, 377, we'll, we'll actually be doing something illegal if we allow you guys to give out condoms. Ms. Kupalan, last year, the Central Intelligence Agency, in a prediction that was extremely controversial in India, and I should add strongly refuted by the Indian government, said that by 2010, India could have as many as 25 million HIV-positive people. You're saying to me that already today it's possible India has 14, perhaps 15 million. How do you respond to the CIA prediction? You know, I, I think it's not something that's completely bizarre. 
I think it's a possibility. This is the fear that should motivate action today. Absolutely. And I really, you know, even the small, small chance that we may have of preventing infections, we must not let it go. Only because of our stupidity. In other words, it's a now or never yeah, situation. Absolutely. And I did just think we're there at the threshold. Anjali Kopalan, a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you, Mr.